Good morning, everyone. This is Lisa Harnish with Certification Partners. We're here today for our latest CIW webinar, End User Security, Trips, Tricks, and Traps. I'm here today with Dr. James Stanger and Stephen Schneider, our presenters today. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. James, I'm going to let you go ahead and take it away. We've covered our housekeeping tasks, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Absolutely. Well, welcome everybody to our uh, webcast uh, today. It's End User Security Tips, Tricks, and Traps. And I'm here uh, with Stephen. Stephen, how are you doing today? I am doing just fine, James. It's a lovely fall Good. day here. And you are in Tennessee, right? You're not traveling around or anything like that? No, I am, I am in the home office today in, in yep. uh, Knoxville. Okay, and I am here in Olympia, Washington, and Lisa's uh, holding down the fort in our uh, uh, Tempe office in uh, basically Phoenix, Arizona. So our agenda, folks, is where we're going to be talking about online threats kind of the hype versus the reality, the latest attacks, and talk about the importance of basically being as secure as possible. And it involves a little bit of ethics, it involves a little bit of smarts, it involves a little bit of software. Um, uh, I'm big on talking about wetware as well, and by wetware, that's my smart aleck name for basically your brain. And so let's make sure that as we go through these, uh, these slides, keep in mind that it's really important when it comes to end user security to always be thinking. So we're going to talk about responsible behavior as well, as well as cool software that we can use and privacy principles. We'll also talk a bit about how CIW foundations can help teach this material. So let's see about our presenters. Uh, there's me, if you can see me. Uh, I am uh, President and Chief Certification Architect of Certification Partners. We own the CIW program. Um, over the years, I've, I've written a few, a few books, worked on a few uh, um, magazine articles and columns, uh, and done a lot of technology consulting, including curriculum development. Uh, Steven Schneider is an expert in Windows and Linux administration and, and, and a great many other things. Uh, uh, is a fantastic author and educator in networking security, uh, has worked um, on web and cloud-based platforms for uh, many years uh, as the, uh, one of the co-authors of LPI Linux in a Nutshell with O'Reilly uh, in his third edition now. Uh, he's done great work there. Um, uh, Stephen, you also uh, design and uh, certifications with me and work on uh, courseware, so we're happy to uh, have you here to talk about end user security. Now, uh, we uh, are CIW. Uh, we are your web and internet certification. We're a skills-based education standard. Uh, that's why we know so much about end-user security. We're a vendor-neutral certification program. We provide certification and training about the best vendor applications and techniques and practices as judged by industry. And we're a globally accepted certification with over 65,000 certified individuals worldwide. But let's get in to our end user security issues. You know, what causes problems and what are some of the reasons and excuses for, you know, what happens here? Well, in other words, why do these kinds of attacks happen? I mean, Stephen, how long have you and I been around and seen the kinds of issues that have presented themselves on the Internet over the years? I mean, we can go back to the Melissa virus or I love you or even earlier, right? And we've Absolutely. seen all of these things. You know, what, what are the main causes in your mind, anyway? You know, as, you, as you look back and as you look at what's going on now, what are the causes here? And I think we've listed them here on the, on the slide, but tell us what you're what your perceptions are. Here. Well, I think the list that you've got in here is 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 great. Inexperience, just clicking, um, and and wind, you know, being in a rush, wanting to get things done and and move forward. Yeah. And and where these things come from, you know, a lot of times it's it's just a matter of you know when when you were commenting about the Melissa virus, not the love bug virus, all those that came out, you know, a lot of it is just because hey, look at what I can do. And even some of the examples that you're going to bring up here are basically a result of that. Hey, look what I can do. And it's our falling forward or, or falling into their hands that, that allow all of this to happen. Yeah, I think so. You know, there are bad guys out there. Yes, there are. And, and they actively seek out ways to exploit problems with our mobile phones or with our desktop computers or whatever. But, you know, there are a lot of other 
reasons and causes out there. And I, I, you know, inexperience is one of them. And it's funny because as p things move to the cloud more or have moved to the cloud more, right, that's a de facto thing. It's already happened. A lot of the things that we're used to using, you know, well, we're used to installing a browser or installing certain pieces of software. Now that they move to the cloud, suddenly that functionality it's there. It's the same functionality we've been using for 10, 15 years, but now it's new again, right? And I think that's what happens. And I think also we are all very impatient when it comes to the Internet. We, we kind of feel it's kind of our entitled right to act quickly and do what we can. And I think that's one of the major issues. Also, we like convenience. I mean, who doesn't? And we want things to be automatic for us. And I think all of those things can cause us to, to lull us into a certain complacency where a bad guy can take advantage of us. Sure. I also think there's another issue, too, when it comes to uh, um, um, platforms that are all the same. That's what uh, I wrote there when I wanted to say uh, homogeneous there. Um, platforms that are all the same. Android. How many of us have an Android? I have one, right? And how many iPhones are there out there? Well, all these systems have the same configuration, Windows phones. And there's also, of course, all the Windows computers that are out there. And yes, we have antivirus software to help us, malware software out there ready to, to help us. But anytime you have a platform that is the same, it's easy for one attacker, right, Stephen, as you said, you know, who's like, well, it's out there, I can do it. Anytime you have one platform where you have hundreds of thousands or millions of users using the exact same thing, it's easy to go out and get it. And uh, let's take a look at the history of it, first of all. Uh, the Robert Morris Internet War back in the 80s. Uh, we already mentioned the Melissa virus, I love you, all the other things, the botnets that are out there. And very recently, um, the Stuxnet virus, uh, uh, for those of you who haven't heard of it, it was a virus that w was basically unleashed on a bunch of um, centrifuges in Iran and was able to, to destabilize what was going on over there. My point is, any time you have a bunch of platforms that are the same, unpatched, all there, they're right targets. So the results of poor security, whether it be our own haste or the fact that we have to use platforms that are all kind of the same, lost days at work, right? I mean, how long will it take for you to get your phone back? If you're anything like me, if I've lost my phone and I'm at work, I'm distracted because I don't have it. It's not ready to go. How long will it take for you to get your data back? Um, you know, these things, these things are worse than sick days in terms of productivity. Uh, you have lost corporate intellectual property that can happen. I know many people who've lost desktops, phones, that have had very sensitive information, and um, uh, these things get lost. And what about your desktop? When you walk away from it at work, do you use a password-protected screensaver? Uh, chances are you don't, and you should. So the losses in time and, and, and revenue are, are frankly staggering. Uh, according to one estimate, uh, from PC oh, Mag, you have you have 114 billion dollars a year uh, in things that have been lost in That's money that has been lost. Um, you also have uh, targeted attacks, and by targeted attacks, I mean concerted efforts that are waged at a company or organization that uh, end up in a loss. That's 200 thousand dollars per incident. Uh, according to a survey taken back in 2011, most of these surveys take a while to create. So the one that's happening, the surveys that are happening now will come out in 2013 and talk all about 2012. So the latest ones we have, for example, in, so in uh, 2011, Sony lost $170 million in one attack alone. And that was based on the compromise of end-user systems. So that's why we're talking about end-user security today. And the cost of attacks themselves has risen at least 56%. So there's a lot of reasons why it's important to do end-user security. Well, let's get into some specific and typical attacks. Stephen, social engineering. I, I listed this one first because I still think that is the top one out there. Because even the viruses and the worms that get released out on the web usually the way that they spread, or at least get started initially, is through social engineering. What do you think? Does that sound about right to you? No, I think social engineering is probably one of the most popular forms of, of delivery for, for attacks. Um, finding yeah. out someone's information, you know, representing yourself as somebody, you know, as, as somebody that would be trusted by the individual, 
and then and then gaining their information. It's so easy to, to do that, frankly. Uh, um, I think that a lot of times, anytime some sort of a request comes across a phone or even from somebody who looks authoritative or whatever, it's easy to just give somebody that information. Uh, we'll be getting into that here in just a couple of slides. I also think there's a lot of shoulder surfing that goes along. And by shoulder surfing, I simply mean somebody looking over your shoulder and, and grabbing sensitive information. Um, I don't know exactly if it was shoulder surfing that happened to me. This is many years ago. Uh, I ended up having a whole bunch of phone charges charged to me over a period of two or three months. Thankfully, the phone company got rid of all of them for me, but it was thousands of dollars. Uh, I was going through uh, LAX to the uh, Los Angeles airport. And this is, gosh, this is 10, 12 years ago. And, um, and basically, uh, somebody I made a phone call then on a pay phone, and somebody got a hold of my uh, caller information for my, my calling card. And I don't know if it was uh, the phone company thought one of two things happened. Somebody shoulder surfed me, right? Or and, uh, it's very possible that they had a very sophisticated device listening in, uh, tapping in on, the, on the, the pay phone. They kind of thought maybe that's what the case was, but it's hard to say. Uh, but nevertheless, it's very easy for these types of things to happen here. Of course, viruses and worms are huge. Zero-day attacks are, are important. Um, uh, in a zero-day attack, you basically have a situation uh, where the bad guy has the code that can exploit it uh, and can uh, exploit a specific attack before a patch comes out. And, you know, now that with the age of mobile computing, it's been on us for a few years. Um, it, you can call it the new frontier or whatever, but all of the old attacks still apply, especially the exploiting of linked accounts, and we'll be talking about that shortly. But here's an example, folks, of a phishing attack, and that's phishing uh, with a PH. Now, Stephen, let's take a look at this email. I, I got it here a while back, and it's it has suspicious things in it right away, but it's actually a fairly convincing little attempt at a phishing attack. This is an email that I received. Uh, I happen to be a Comcast uh, member. Comcast is an ISP here in the United States. And here is a very nice little simple um, you know, uh, message. It's actually spelled correctly. It has a little bit of official things to it here. And it looks like, well, uh, my account has been suspended for some reason. But then if you take a look at some of the details, and this is the key, if you look at some of the details of the link itself that it's asking you to go to, there are some problems here. Take a look at the red circle. See, that is the link that the xfinity.comcast.net unsuspend um, link is actually sending me to. In other words, the email looks like it's sending me to something legit. But if you, you, are, if you look at the code, the actual headers of the code that I've circled in red, it's sending me to a goofy site to something that is not at all legitimate. Now, this could be, uh, and, uh, and what I did is uh, just because I knew what was going on, I, I did actually take another system, and I clicked on the link. And this is the page, if you can see it, that it sent me to. Looks like the Comcast Xfinity site. Okay, it looks it really does. good. It really does. You know, it's, it's not too bad, is it? Now, um, you know, and what it does is it gives a sign in there and a password. Now, can anybody, Lisa or uh, Stephen, guess what's going to happen here when I end, enter my email and username and password? What's going to happen there? They've got your username and your password. Yeah. It, all that is is a CGI script that just pops that, that populates a database. And now they've got my username and password, and they can begin to own my identity for my cable ISP. That, that's not a good thing, folks. Okay, That means that they can gain access to my email and all sorts of information. And if I'm like, and thankfully I'm not, but if I'm like 99% of end users out there, I have a feeling that once they have that one password, they'd be able to get into any number of things from other, from Facebook stuff to email, uh, sorry, to uh, web-based uh, banking accounts, all sorts of fun things. So let me go back one slide here if I can. Let's see, previous. Um, the other thing that, uh, now my email account uh, would have alerted me on this, but there are a lot of people who will access things from their mobile phone. And a lot of mobile phones don't have the functionality that says, hey, this looks kind of goofy here. Um, but it's very easy for people in haste to avoid warnings and for people in haste 
to get past, uh, to, to ignore these sorts of things. And that's what made this type of attack so extremely effective back, mm -hmm. you know, a few years ago before we started catching on to, you know, this, this type of phishing thing. How many times did you get letters from banks that you didn't even have an account with, you know, that, mm -hmm. that said, you know, your account is in, you know, compromise. Please enter in your information, click this link and enter in your information so that we can verify that, you know, your, your identity. Um, and, and there was a tremendous amount of people that actually fell for that. Um, so it's, and, and it's the ability, just as what you're showing on the screen now, James, to have a site that looks identical to the, to, you know, the actual end user site, and then gaining that ever important information of username and password. And um, the other thing that's kind of interesting here is that, uh, again, this is a bit more sophisticated than a lot of those. Uh, uh, how many, I mean, I get those all the time. You know, some, some account in the UK or whatever that I've never had or whatever. But in this case, this one sends me also to a link that says effectively careeracademy.co.uk. The reason I find that interesting is um, we, we do business with the Career Academy or work with them. Right, and even though it's completely misspelled, I mean it's a different URL. Who knows who owns it, etc. It's completely wrong. The fact that that we actually that I know who they are personally, and then I do have a Comcast account and an Xfinity account. This could be possibly I don't know yet, but well, not yet, but I'm not so sure. But this very easily could be a spear phishing uh, attempt, and by spear phishing, that means that instead of broadcasting it out there, hoping that somebody is going to get suckered into it. They kind of know something about the person who they're sending it to. That's what spear phishing is. It's a more specific attack. So I thought I'd bring that in as an example of the kinds of attacks that happen out there. So I think the best way to make yourself hack bait right, is, is to have convenience own you. In other words, we all want to have convenience. Right? I just mentioned that earlier. But Hackers love to exploit our need for convenience, okay? And what happens is, is that uh, we all want to set up trust relationships between one account and another, between our LinkedIn and our Twitter account and our Facebook and our phone. Why not? It makes it easy once we get images, uh, an image into our phone, we can pop it right up to Flickr or whatever we want, right, Stephen? Is that that makes sense, and this is basically it's a complete of, convenience issue. You know, it, it goes yeah, back to that yeah. convenience. You know, why do I want to waste time on my mobile device trying to log in when I can just log in using my Facebook account or my Gmail account? Mm -hmm. And it's all about trust relationships. Back, back, you know, many years ago, Unix systems we set up trust relationships between them, so it was easy to move from one system to another. We do this all the time with Windows systems, database systems. Today, it's a common thing. Well, end users do the same thing. So uh, uh, there was a prominent tech blogger, Matt Honan, uh, who uh, is an example of what happens when you rely on convenience too much. He got attacked, and attackers were able to wipe out all of his computers, mobile devices, I think files off his desktop. They accessed his Gmail account. They posted tweets on his Twitter account. As I really felt so, I really feel sorry yeah. for Matt, you know, but he even admits in his in the article that he wrote about it, you know, it is it's his own fault for not following the procedures that we're getting ready to talk about. But it's yeah. it was not just him either. You know, Twitter suffered or not uh, not Twitter, excuse me, Gizmodo actually suffered some yeah. from what happened with Matt because Matt is a former employee of Gizmodo. He, he he used to write for them as well, and his Twitter account for Gizmodo was still effective, and and had had <laughs> passwords to actually post Twitter in Gizmodo's name. And once the hackers had his information for his iPhone and his his uh, MacBook, uh, they also had access to his Gizmodo Twitter account, and they posted all sorts of uh, inappropriate uh, tweets. Uh, that looked like they were coming from Gizmodo. And so they so suffered things, from that yeah. attack as well. So these things impact not only Honan's reputation, but also the company he worked for. Interestingly enough, not even works for, right, that he used Correct. to work for. These, this is why end user security is so important, because it affects your work relationships, it affects your personal relationships, et cetera, et cetera. So 
uh, a, there are uh, some atypical attacks out there that happen in addition to phishing stuff that still goes on. Uh, geolocation. Uh, we all have our phones. We carry them with us. We keep our GPS on. Uh, more and more attackers seem to be focusing in on that fact, and they can find out where you are and then attack, uh, conduct attacks based on your location. Also, there's Wi-Fi phishing, uh, simply where uh, I think all of us have gone to a, whether it be a hotel or some public place, Starbucks or whatever, and we log in using public Wi-Fi, very nice and convenient. What happens if somebody sets up a rogue access point, asks for what seems like innocuous information, and then gets a hold of it? And this is what happens in Wi-Fi phishing. They configure an access point that looks legit. It's, uh, uh, for all we know, they've taken a foundations course and learned all about how to do this, and then they, they go rogue and they go bad. And they basically will connect this access point to, a, to an area where people are getting internet access, and then they will start collecting information. And they can, they can possibly get credit card information, of course. Authentication information is another thing that they're looking for. So Wi-Fi phishing is uh, something that is uh, happening more and more all the time. Now, the latest attacks that seem to be going on really are kind of the usual suspects, okay? You know, phishing and spear phishing, a lot of password compromise, dictionary and brute force uh, attacks, uh, people, you know, repeatedly guessing passwords. Uh, a lot of shoulder surfing, as I mentioned before. There's also buffer overflows going on with web browsers. And with these web browsers, once that happens, people are uh, able to access sensitive information on desktops. Hey, James. <laughs> One yeah. other thing that you could actually add onto that list is kind of a subset mm -hmm. of shoulder surfing, possibly mm -hmm. a modified shoulder surfing, is almost stalking. Um, and that's when, uh, for instance, one company um, w actually had a breach uh, from an administrative assistance account. And mm -hmm. what the attacker did was they friended uh, this administrative assistant uh, on Facebook and followed her throughout her social networking uh, accounts and, and watched her activity, watched the information that she did, and then was able to go into her corporate account, uh, do a password reset request, like you had forgotten your password, and basically Perfect. from the information they had gained that she put out on her social media sites, was able to answer the security questions that were in there and get, then get access to her uh, account. Uh, for the uh, for her company that she worked for, and then was able to gain access into uh, into uh, uh, secure information. You know, we've got a name for that. It's social stalking, right? And that's what people are doing, and what they're doing is they're exploiting their way up the stack, as it were. So, you know, from very public information to much more private information. Right. And like, you, and that's interesting. Uh, it reminds me of a group of high school students uh, that will go, go nameless who once did a survey of their principal and the secretaries asking innocuous questions, you know, what's your wife's name, pet's name and everything. And that was really a social network, a social engineering attempt, very successful one, to get the passwords that the principal, the secretaries of the school were using, right, so that they, the, the kids could hack into the school network. So you really yes, did that? The, oh no, no, no I would never. <laughs> I could never even describe something like that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, deceit is a wonderful thing, isn't it? So these are the kinds of things that go on, and you'll notice it's kind of back to the future. Uh, sorry for all the movie references, but it's kind of back to the future. You take things that have existed, and then you apply them to, to uh, uh, at least to some people, or the new platforms out there. Well, how do we fix the problem? And Stephen, you talked about a lot. Uh, you, know, you alluded to the fact that we've got you know privacy principles that we outline here. And uh, you know, first of all, don't speed on the internet, as it were. Right? Don't compute when you're too busy. Uh, we all know how bad it is to text while drive. I hope you're not doing that. But distracted computing is really, uh, when it comes to the internet anyway, just as bad as distracted driving. If you know what I'm trying to. Um, it's it's very important to make sure that you are acting responsibility responsibly. Consistency is also a big thing, right? Are you consistently acting in a secure way? Um, I don't know about you, Stephen, but I have tons of bad habits, and and one of them is just haste. I, you know, there's lots of things to do in a day, and it's easy to uh, not be consistent when it comes to your brain processing information. 
but so there, there are ways to be consistent when it comes to uh, working on the internet. Uh, first of all, update your your software often, your operating system, your your mobile phone, your tablet, and also develop secure computing habits. Any, what do you think, Stephen? Any? It it's it's something that we all do, James. Um, I I fell victim last fall to a a malware attack on on my computer when I was trying to watch a football game on TV and work uh, work on my laptop and and uh, a box popped up. I was paying more attention to the football game and just said, "Yeah, click, okay, go for it." And and uh, bad things happened after that. And and so it's something that we all do, but we really do need to pay attention to what's going on on the screen. I think for travelers, too, it's a big issue. I never had much of a problem with my Windows system that I would boot into every once in a while uh, uh, until I started traveling and I wasn't behind my firewall anymore. Then I had a system that I had not properly updated. I connected it directly to the Internet, and as you said, bad things happen. So um, take your time to process information. There are other things you can do as well, though. Encrypting drives and files. Uh, we're gonna, in a minute, we'll be getting into some BitLocker stuff and using uh, applications such as TrueCrypt. Uh, also, avoid the use of public hotspots to send sensitive information. If you're using unencrypted email or badly encrypted email and doing that, don't use a public hotspot to do that. Uh, or if you're sending email, uh, sensitive information across email that's not encrypted, again, avoid doing so. Just wait a while. Uh, I also suggest disabling services on your phone as you travel. <clears throat> Wi-Fi and GPS, yes, you can, you can activate those things once you get somewhere, but while you're traveling, why would you have those things going? And after all, they, they suck the life out of your battery anyway while you're traveling. Um, I suggest that you store password information in encrypted files. We'll be talking about some password vault software shortly. Uh, and avoid using clear text protocols. These are uh, some of the secure computing habits you'll want to get into. And I know when you state them, it's like, oh, that's obvious. It's like, well, I'm telling you right now, it, it becomes less than obvious once you're in a hurry or you have a job to do, whatever job that might be. I think the big thing is to take responsibility. You know, the, the Internet was founded on the premise that, that its users know how to behave online. And by behave, I mean not only saying and doing nice things, but also knowing how to use the equipment that is at their fingertips. So it's your responsibility, and that's, that's a very important uh, thing to think about. We all feel, I think, it's somewhere in our minds at times that we're entitled to get on the Internet. It's, it's, it's ours, after all. But remember, there is a sense of responsibility there, and acting properly is, is you know, kind of what we're really going over today. And it's a question of citizenship uh, and, and making sure that you not only behave ethically and, and understand people's cultural differences, et cetera, but also that you don't make yourself a target when it comes to uh, your behavior online, either by skipping an update or saying something that makes you some sort of target. Well, let's get into some practical solutions, Stephen, and talk about some of the issues that can apply, uh, apply with these practical issues. Now, we've spent some time talking about, like I said, the wetware, your brain, you know, uh, don't act too quickly. But there is an old uh, term out here. It's called the CIA triad. Stephen, I, I assume you've heard of this before. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> And with this triad, it's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. In other words, the ability to keep things secret, the ability when it comes to integrity to keep data so you know who's changed it. You know, if Stephen, if you, you've come across a file that's been edited, it's like, well, I didn't edit this. I didn't change this. That means that it's possible that that document has lost its integrity. Uh, and then availability. These are really important concepts. And they've been around, Stephen, how, how long has this idea of the CIA triad been around? Um, since we started exchanging information, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think, well, okay. Yeah. Okay. The, the very concepts have been around probably since uh, you know the, the first stone tablet, I suppose. But uh, when it comes to computing, pe people have been talking about this old saw for a long time. And, but you know, it's been taught enough to where if everybody got it and understood it, uh, you know, we wouldn't have these problems. So clearly. Um, uh, it's worth mentioning, right? It doesn't solve all the problems, though, because you know where is you know your uh, where does that CIA triad talk about your you know your brain, your wetware? It, it doesn't, you know. So that's one of the major issues. But let's talk about um, 
the importance of the CIA triad technically, you know, as a technical solution, um, and, and how we use this uh, specifically to protect our devices. Now, first of all, when it comes to confidentiality, password-protected screensavers, right? Uh, when it comes to availability, you back up your data, right? This is how you do it. Stephen, when you, you know, uh, without giving details, what kinds of things do you do when it comes to backing up information? I, I use Dropbox. Uh, I don't know what you use. Oh, James, always do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Uh, but no, actually, you're, you're a parent, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 Now, um, my my backups, as as you have have seen in the past, and my drive crashes and and my data is gone. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I I am I am a typical end user, but no, I have improved my practices, and I do use services like Dropbox. I also have an external drive that I try and regularly. Uh, uh, backup data with, and I have mm -hmm. gotten much better at doing things like uh, like uh, uh, encrypting sensitive uh, mail uh, and and also watching my passwords, which is extremely important. You know, and so if you have multiple passwords and you don't want to write them down, or or you do write them down, or you put them in some unencrypted file somewhere that you carry it around with you, grab some password storage software. Uh, you know, some sort of password safe. It's all about there. Um, it's it's all out there. I should say. Um, there's quite a bit of it out there. And basically, what happens is Vault software, uh, such as the TrueCrypt, has that function actually. Um, Basically, what it does is even though you are putting all your passwords in one place, at least it's heavily encrypted. And now you have one password to, re to remember. And I realize if that bad guy gets a hold of that one password, then you have issues. But frankly, having that, in this case, that one point, um, that one password is probably better than having multiple passwords um, being found on one unencrypted file. Um, let's talk about backup. Uh, there's Google Drive, there's SkyDrive, there's 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 Dropbox, there's Woolala. There are many uh, services that are available uh, for you. Very convenient. I find Dropbox to be particularly convenient. Now, uh, there are issues like will Dropbox, uh, you know, store that data successfully and and securely. What happens if somebody gets a hold uh, of Dropbox's uh, main accounts and is somehow able to grab that data? Don't know what to say about that, to be honest. Other than I store locally as well, but I think it's really important to have things. Uh, I, I love cloud-based storage because if there's some sort of issue um, and I'm traveling, I can get up there and access. It. Well, what James, and I, and I think that's the key point. And and mm -hmm. you know, like we were talking a few minutes ago, you know, I like my physical drive, my USB drive that I plug in here at the house. Um, you know, as far as that's mm -hmm. what I'm going to rely on should I have a system crash. It. Um, again, or when I have a system crash again, the the issue with online cloud-based storage. You know, we were joking just a minute ago. What happens when the cloud goes down? You know, just earlier this year, Dropbox had an issue where they had had something yeah. uh, with authentication, and where all of a sudden they had uh, anybody had access to any of the information, uh, which Dropbox is somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 million users now, uh, and and all of that information was available for a short period of time earlier this year. Um, and so, you know, that is the type of issue that we face with cloud-based storage solutions. They're good and we have access to them, but, you know, how secure are they going to be? What happens when somebody does uh, get, get access to them? What type of information is stored out there? SkyDrive, you know, if, if you're using your, your MSN account, a Microsoft account to to gain access to SkyDrive and your other uh, your other uh, solution services. Uh, we we've talked about linking accounts again, so somebody may have access to to your information from there. So there's a lot of things to consider uh, when when of about the information that we're putting in cloud-based storage. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. It's so easy for uh, uh, because it, we still own, in a sense, the data, but it's very easy for these third parties to have people make requests of them, and then your data becomes available to them, whether it be law enforcement or whatever. What happens if the company gets bought? Uh, uh, there's all sorts of, I think, considerations there to, that you have to keep in mind. So, um, you know, and are the contents encrypted while they're being stored? on your 
cloud provider or at home for that matter, right? What about access options? You can access by email account name or by user account name. Is the provider stable? What attacks have occurred against the provider, Stephen, as you suggested? Um, of course, use VPNs whenever you can. And people are like, well, if it's work-related, yeah, I use VPNs. I mean, any company I've ever worked for has required some sort of use of a VPN if you're working from home, et cetera. But, you know, you can set up virtual VPNs, as it were, or your own VPNs, if you want, between you, your friends. Between, uh, you know, Stephen, you and I, I think, have done that in the past, where we've, it, it, mostly for experimental reasons. But you can do this very easily to create some sort of encrypted tunnel between ourselves. That way, we know when we're exchanging information properly. And so it's something to consider uh, as, as a tool to secure your system. Um, when it comes to password management, once again, change your passwords often. Make your passwords reasonably complex. Uh, based on the platform that you're using. In other words, if you're using Apple's platforms, go up to their support and find out what they would recommend for passwords. Microsoft, the same thing. Facebook, I just drew out three examples. Whatever platform you are using, I suggest you follow their specific advice because they will have their own authentication schemes, own authentication algorithms, and each is different and um, requires you to use a, a specific strength of a password. And not all passwords, if it, one that may be strong for Apple may not be as strong for Microsoft. So that's, that's uh, my advice uh, uh, for you in, in regards to password management. The other thing, James, I would simply throw in there is, especially if you travel a lot with your laptop or mobile device or whatnot, the ability to save that information within the browser. How easy is it for us to log into a site and the browser come up with a, with a box? Would you like this browser to save this information so that you remain logged into this? Okay. And, yeah. and, and you know, okay. that's, that's a, that could be a very large gaping hole uh, if someone were to gain access to our computer. Yeah, I totally I agree. That's a great point, Stephen. Great point. Well, you know what we do uh, at CIW is we talk about uh, uh, certification, and we teach people these very same concepts. And at, with CIW Web Foundations, uh, which we really should be calling a CIW Internet Foundations, um, uh, these are courses that are and certifications that are available right now that teach these very concepts at in our internet. Business Associate Certification, and of course, we teach this. Site Development Associate, we then move people more from being consumers of the web to being producers and to being uh, web experts. And we move people with our Network Technology Associate into being experts in, in networking. But with all the foundations, you learn all of the concepts we've been talking about and more in great detail. So we highly recommend that you use uh, these tools available to you, these, this education that's available to you. Well, why do we know so much about end user security? Well, it's not just because Stephen's so smart as part of it. It's we have an advisory <laughs> council that teaches us and shows us what industry wants. And we regularly listen to people from academic, uh, from government, uh, from industry and non-for-profit who give us information on a regular basis about how to improve um, how to improve our courseware, but also the kinds of standards and practices that we should be following. Uh, as a result, CIW has been seen as a proven way to fast track your career. Internet.com has named us a top developer cert, for example, one of the top five certifications in the world. Uh, recently, CompTIA has approved um, CIW Foundations, for example, and other CIW certifications as part of its continuing education uh, uh, program. So you can take CIW certifications and get continuing education uh, credit for A+. So as a result of all of our efforts, CIW puts people on a lifelong learning path, not a vendor's product treadmill. And they learn more than they would than the average bear about various topics. And that's as a result, once you move from CIW foundations into, say, our JavaScript developer certification or our database developer certification, you get higher pay because you know more about the foundational issues and the techniques that are, uh, that are available to whatever profession. So um, I'm just summing through some examples of some of the ways in which you can get a significant increase in pay based on this. Now, based on what CIW teaches. 
A lot of people say a lot of nice things about CIW, um, that certificates are in high demand. If your CIW, if your resume has a CIW certification on it, then you'll get a better start in the IT industry over other candidates. We've also worked with corporations such as SimCorp and Consonus. Uh, they've taken a look at CIW Foundations training, and they found that it is a very useful certification because it allows technologists to talk to non-technologists on an even level. In other words, people can communicate better with each other. They can compute more securely. Uh, Jim Bush, for example, a veteran in security and virtualization, said the stuff he learned at Foundation is material he should probably already know, and now he does because he took CIW Foundation. Well, that's a, a quick overview of what CIW Foundations is. In this specific webcast, Stephen and I have talked about online threats, how to res uh, act responsibly and ethically. Uh, we've learned more about essential privacy principles uh, so that you can work in an interconnected world in a secure way and how CIW certifications prepare you to compute uh, securely. Stephen, before I finish this particular thing, do you have any other thoughts that you'd like to add about uh, uh, this particular webcast about securing, uh, securing yourself as an end user? I would just like to throw out, James, that we've, we've, you've presented a lot of great information about things that we can do to protect information online. And it's not necessarily a matter that, that you need to go out and perform all of these things, which would be great, but even if you took some steps to uh, encrypting your information or, or better password management or backup procedures, I, I think about the old commercials. Do you, James, do you ever remember the club that you could put on your car to, to uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. on the steering wheel yeah. of the car? And and yeah. it wasn't the the thing about it was it was not so much that it protected your car that much because yes, you know people could get it off, but the thing was it took time to do it, and and so just seeing that club, you know, thwarted off, you know, almost ninety percent of car burglaries uh, for the yeah, most go part. Elsewhere. That's right. They go elsewhere, and and the same thing is true with you know secure Wi-Fi, encrypted information, uh, secure passwords. So even by implementing just a few of these uh, options, you're protecting yourself online. Yeah, now, very good point, Stephen. Very good point. Yeah, I think it's all about raising that bar, isn't it? You know, it is uh, for for the bad guys. Well, um, so uh, there is the, 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 the bulk of the webcast. We have a few minutes for, just a few minutes actually, for questions. Uh, Lisa, what kind of questions have we had thus far? Uh, it's really been pretty quiet in the questions poll today. Um, we did have a question earlier from Nick Newell. Um, early on you were talking about, uh, you were showing us an example of a spam message that appeared to be content, contacting you as a Comcast user. And, uh, you know, there. Nick Newell was wondering how did the, the people who sent you the, the message in the first place, how did they know that you were a Comcast user in the first place? That's and, a great uh, I question. Was, uh, yeah. It is a good question. Yeah. I tried to answer it, and I, I think I, I know the answer, but I'll let you answer your, in your words. You know, uh, here's, here's my thought about that. Now, one thing I think about is this. Uh, most ISPs will buy blocks of IP addresses. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, countries will do the same thing, governments. And uh, it's possible that the attacker said, well, it's possible this person is using an IP address, uh, this IP address, and, and so you know, knows, how, how should I put it, they just know a certain block of IP addresses that Comcast uses, and so they created that specific attack for that block of IP addresses. There's, there's my guess. Uh, what, what, what do you okay. think? Um, my theory was that, you know, if you know if there's such a thing as an organization out there that's trying to to do a lot of this you know mass amount of hacking, uh, I will frequently get messages from a lot of different services I don't even use, banks that I don't have accounts with, um, other yeah. ISPs that I don't use. I figure it's all coming from one or similar related sources. The ones that I know I'm not using, I, I instantly recognize that spam and promptly delete it. Then if I get one for, that is from the bank that I use or is from the ISP that I use, I'll stop and take a moment and think, hey, is that really me or is that not? You know, and, hmm. and so to me, it's like it's part of that, you know, shot in the dark, you know, phishing and, and you know, they're just throwing out message after message after message, hoping that, you know, sooner or later you're going to pause at the one that is relevant to you. And yeah. um, that was my assumption. 
Yeah, and I think um, I think the other thing too is I doubt that Comcast itself got hacked or anything. I just think that uh, you know it, maybe this person just got lucky or whatever. But it, I just found it to be an almost unique case, and and in the same way that you know whereas fishing you use a net or you use a, mm -hmm. a line and you hope you grab something that comes along the way. If you're spear fishing, you're down there and you're in the water and you you're saying I want that particular fish, and that right. that would be interesting. Possibly, uh, I don't know. Uh, that's the possibly. Yeah interesting thing about that particular attack. Yeah. Uh, another user is asking, uh, are, do home, home users really need firewalls and what kinds of firewalls on their home computers? What are your thoughts on that? You know, uh, I'll start with uh, with my two bit opinion here, and then uh, Stephen, you can have yours. Uh, but uh, you know, desktop firewall software doesn't turn me on as much as an actual firewall. And I, what I would do is, uh, once that uh, DSL modem or cable modem comes out of the wall, I would go to the store and buy yes, some sort of Cisco Linksys or whatever. Uh, it could be an access point, wireless access point in com combination with a normal. How should I put it? A normal switch, uh, but there should be firewall software there. And 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 really, the major reason I'm not so much worried about some bad guy attacker coming in through that pipe there. I am worried about mm -hmm. worms coming in through there and viruses and other issues mm -hmm. that can attack my Windows system. And a firewall will I won't say get rid of all of it, but will get rid of a great majority of it. So, Stephen, what do you think, man? I I agree with you. Uh, James, very very much. I am I am not a fan of desktop uh, firewalls. There are a lot of third third party products out there, uh, applications that you can install on your computer, internet mm -hmm. security, and things of that nature. To me, all they do is take up your system resources. Uh, yeah. I am a, in fan, just as James was saying, going to the store and getting any one of the number of of uh, you know wireless slash wired uh, routers. Uh, for your for your broadband cable at the house, uh, the most important thing in there is you can gain access to it and set up your firewall inside of there, and set yeah. up the type of security that you that you are going to want to enable, as James talked about earlier, um, and then you know who has access to it, and 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 making it as secure as possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're traveling a lot, then maybe uh, you know desktop firewall or, or you know heavy malware, you know protection software is, is important. Uh, you know I could see that, but if if you've got that typical setup where your your mobile device is is behind a Wi-Fi um, connection that is connecting to uh, your your ISP, I think that having a firewall in between there is a big deal. I think you need it. All right. Thank you for the information, James. Um, I do see we are a couple of minutes past the hour. I don't see any more questions popping up, so we can go ahead and start wrapping it up. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, uh, our next webcast, folks, is about the new analytics, and we're talking about measuring today's communication, things such as Hadoop and MapReduce, and talking about what that is and uh, what that means. And we'll be uh, talking about that in October. So uh, go up to our website, ciwcertified.com, to learn more about it. Uh, thank you for your time, uh, mm -hmm. Stephen. Thank you so much for uh, uh, for being here. It's fantastic to present with you. And uh, this is our contact information, everybody. You can uh, feel free to contact us with any comments or questions at all. And of course, follow us today uh, at Twitter, at Facebook, uh, at LinkedIn, and YouTube. Uh, Stephen, you've got all sorts of channels going. You've got a great tw Twitter account, so uh, we recommend. I recommend those highly. We recommend that you uh, follow us in these ways to learn more about us. <laughs>